الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين Welcome brothers and sisters to another installment of our light study of selected a hadith from Riyadh al-Salihin and today we'll be looking at the 26th hadith of our study and we are still currently in the chapter of piety bab at-taqwa and the hadith we have entitled it praying for piety praying for piety and that hadith is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama kana yaqul Allahumma inni asaluka al-huda wa al-tuqa wa al-afafa wa al-ghina Allahumma inni asaluka al-huda wa al-tuqa wa al-afafa wa al-ghina rawahu al-imam muslim so in this hadith, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he used to say the following supplication. O oh Allah, I ask you for guidance, for piety, for chastity, and self-sufficiency. O oh Allah, I ask you for guidance, piety, chastity, and self-sufficiency. And the hadith was collected by Imam Muslim rahimahullahu ta'ala. In this hadith of the Laib Mas'ud, he informs us that he informs us that the Prophet وسلم, regularly made this dua asking Allah for Arabati Umur, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for four things: guidance, piety, chastity, and self-sufficiency. Now this means that you and I should be even more keen to make this dua on a regular basis for two reasons. So we have the Prophet ﷺ making this dua for four things, and it was his regular custom and practice as indicated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So now we're saying that learning this from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, we should be even more keen to learn this dua and to make this dua on a regular basis. And the reason why we should be more keen is twofold. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ is our role model. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانْ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ He says, you have in the Messenger of Allah the most excellent example for he who desires the meeting with Allah, he longs for the meeting with Allah and the last day. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the Prophet's our role model. When we see him doing something that has something to do with the religion, we should what? We should follow his lead. And when we see him praying for something, we should follow his lead because that shows us that that prayer or that thing is something which we should covet as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi covets it because, I'm sorry, covets it because he is our example and role model. The second reason is because the Prophet ﷺ is already the most guided, the most pious, the most chaste, the most self-sufficient person in his generation at the very least. And we could argue he's the most pious, chaste, uh, most pious, chaste, guided, and self-sufficient person of all time. We could argue that. So if he, despite his massive share of these qualities, felt the need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frequently for these very same qualities, that means that those of us who lack his share, we have less than his share, we're not as pious, as guided, as chaste, as self-sufficient as the Prophet So if he has this massive share of these qualities and he's asking Allah for more, asking Allah to maintain what he has and to give him more, then those of us who have less of these qualities should be even more keen to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these qualities. So the Prophet, he prayed, Allahumma inni asalakul huda. Oh Allah, I ask you for guidance. And the scholars of Islam, some of them have defined al-huda in this way. Al-ilmu bil-haq wa tawfiqu lit-tiba'ihi. Knowledge of the truth and the divine empowerment to follow it. So al-huda is two degrees, it's two things, it's not just one thing. It's as they said, al-ilmu bil-haq, knowing the truth, recognizing the truth for what it is, wa tawfiq lit-tiba'ihi, 
and the, and the divine empowerment to follow it. So guidance is two degrees. He died to the Ishad, being guided to the truth or shown the way. And some of the scholars have expressed it saying, Al-Hidayah ila as-sirat, being guided to the path, being shown the path, right? And the second degree of Al-Hidayah is Hidayah to dilala or Hidayat, I'm sorry, Hidayat at Tawfiq. The first one is Hidayat al Ishad or Dilala. The second one is Hidayat at Tawfiq. Being guided to follow the truth, meaning embracing and adopting it. Being guided and given the ability to embrace it and to adopt it and to put it into practice, right? To live in accordance with the truth that is recognized. And so this, the scholars have expressed alternatively by saying Al-Hidayah fi as-sirat, being guided along the path, all right? Or guided, you're already guided to the path, now you're being guided along the path. So when we pray for guidance, brothers and sisters, whether we pray for it in our prayers, when we read Al-Fatiha, Ihdina Salat Al-Mustaqeem, or we make this dua of the Prophet, Allahumma inni asalaku al-huda wa tuqa wa al-afafu wa al-ghina, or we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for hidayah in some other prayer, whether a formal prayer or an informal prayer, we should intend both degrees. We shouldn't intend one of them with the exception of the other. Because not everyone who is shown the way is gifted with the ability to follow it. There are many people who are shown the way by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but He deprives them of the ability and the empowerment to follow the path once it has been shown to, him, to them. And there are a few examples that we could mention, and we'll mention uh, two ala ujala. The first one is Fir'aun. Fir'aun was certainly shown the path of truth by Musa and his brother Harun, uh, alayhim as -salam. So for example, in Surah uh, An-Nazi'at, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to, uh, he tells us that he said to Musa, اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى. فَقُولَ لَهُ فَرَمْ فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تُزَكَّى وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَىٰ فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَىٰ So in, this, in these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He said to Musa, He told him, He said, Go to Fir'aun, because he has transgressed all bounds. And say to him, um, Would you like me to purify you? Would you like me to purify you and guide you to your Lord so that you might fear him? Then Moses, Musa alayhi salam, he showed him al-ayat al-kubra. He showed him the great signs. Wa so Musa guided him to the path, but Fir'aun was not guided along the path, was not given the, given the empowerment to follow the path once it was shown to him. Fakadhaba wa asa. He belied Musa and disobeyed him, rejected the truth. Another example is example of Abu, Abu, I'm sorry, example of Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa sallam. That the Prophet um, during his lifetime, one of his chief defenders was his uncle, who remained a mushrik, remained a polytheist, an idolater upon the religion of the pagans of Mecca, but defended and firmly believed that his, uh, his nephew was upon the truth, that his nephew was not a liar, and that he was not an imposter or a charlatan. But he felt the need to remain committed to the faith of his forefathers. So this went on for several years as the Prophet preached in Mecca, and ultimately, toward the end of the Prophet's mission in Mecca, Abu Talib, he died, or he was approaching death, he was in the throes of death, and the Prophet went to him one last time to plead with him and to try to guide him to the truth and to get him to accept Islam before his death. So he said to him, he said, Ay am, قُلْ لَا إِلَهِ لَلَّهِ كَلِمَةً وَحَاجُ لَكَ بِهَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ He said, oh my dear uncle, please just say these words, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ words that if you say them, I will be able to argue on your behalf and plead your case on the day of resurrection. And he kept pleading with him, but ultimately, when Abu Talib died, he died, and his last words were, Huwa ala millati Abdul Muttalib. 
upon the faith or the path or the religion of Abdul Muttalib, his forefathers, meaning the religion of paganism. Al Muhim Abu Talib was shown the way, but he was not given the tawfiq, he was not given the divine empowerment to follow the way after he was after it was shown to him. And so, brothers, we do not, we, brothers and sisters, we should not suffice ourselves in terms of our intention when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance, whether in formal prayer or in um, supplications and adi'ya, like the one that we're studying right now, the, the, the supplication of the Prophet in which he said, Allahumma inni asalukul huda. When we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance, we should intend both degrees of guidance. He died al irshad, being shown the way, right? And hidayat at tawfiq being empowered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and enabled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to follow the way once we recognize the truth, following it accordingly. Then the Prophet went on the dua and he said, um, he said, what tuqa? Piety. And this is the shahid or the part of the report pertinent to the chapter of a taqwa, the chapter of a piety, of piety. Now piety here. As we mentioned previously, it refers to al-qudra wal-hazm ala fi'li awamid Allah wa shinabi nawahi. The discipline to fulfill one's religious obligations, doing what Allah has ordered us to do, and to abstain, on the other hand, from prohibited deeds generally, to avoid what Allah has prohibited. This is what it means in a practical sense to have a taqwa. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ is praying for and teaching us by his example to pray for. Then he said, wal afafa, chastity. Now, chastity here refers to a specific kind of abstinence. We said that a taqwa refers to abstinence in general. Oh Allah, give me the ability to abstain from haram, right? In general. But al afaf is a specific type or specific kind of abstinence. And that is the abstinence or the abstaining from illicit relationships and unlawful intercourse. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned al afaf abstaining from the sin of a zina. He mentioned it here specifically, although when he said a tuqa, it was included because zina is a sin. And the Prophet is asking when he asked for a taqwa, he's asking to be protected from falling into sin in general. But he asks here specifically, I'm sorry, he asks here to be protected specifically from a specific sin. And that is the sin of a zina. And the reason for that, the reason why the Prophet now, after mentioning al-am, he mentions al-khas, the reason why the Prophet did that is because one, man, as we mentioned previously, is particularly weak when it comes to sexual desires. And we mentioned previously, we mentioned this previously when we're covering the previous hadith, and we'll mention it again here, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about man and his desire for intercourse and his desire for um, relationships with the opposite sex. He says, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا And man was created weak with this weakness for sexual pleasures and lust, etc. And Tawus, he explained, he said, ضَعِيفٌ فِي أَمْرِ nisa, Weak when it comes to what? When it comes to the opposite sex or women. Number two, the second reason why the Prophet ﷺ, he specifically mentioned an afaf and therefore, and by extension, mentioned a zina, Okay, or being protected from a zina, even though it was included in his prayer for a taqwa, because the crime of illicit relations is particularly egregious in the religion of Allah. So these are the two reasons why the Prophet, after mentioning al-am, mentioned what? Al-khas, or the specific. After mentioning the general, he mentioned the specific. Then the Prophet concludes his dua by saying, wal ghina and self-sufficiency. And basically what the Prophet means here is, Oh Allah, grant me independence. And that independence, it's various, it's general, it's all inclusive. Could be physical independence, not to be physically dependent upon anyone. Could mean financial independence, not to be financially dependent upon anyone and have to ask people for things to fulfill my financial needs, right? Um, and it could mean other things. That results, the, the end result, what the Prophet is requesting is that he be enabled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be independent and only dependent upon Allah alone. And after Allah, after his dependence upon Allah, depending upon himself and no one else from creation.
So the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging us indirectly to seek to be independent and not to be the people who ask people for other things. Because dependency on others is the first step toward what? Toward a shirk. Towards uh, once you become dependent upon others, relying upon others, that is one step that brings you closer to worshiping them or associating them as partners with Allah in things which are specific to Allah worship and otherwise. Lessons. What lessons can we take? What things, what can we take away, brothers and sisters, from what we heard today? Number one, every Muslim should make it a point to regularly ask Allah to provide him or her with what will benefit him or her in the hereafter. We should make it a regular point that when we're asking, inshallah ta'ala, we're always asking Allah for things. But we should make sure that we're not only asking Allah for worldly things. Not only, not, not just asking Allah for that promotion. Asking Allah to help us, facilitate for us to get a better car, a bigger house, new clothing, right? Asking Allah to help us to get married. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to have a child. We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these things. Nothing's wrong with asking for these things, but they're all worldly things. Our adi'ya, our du'a should not be confined or exclusive to these worldly things. But rather, we should be keen to ask Allah for the good of the hereafter. Right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes the good people versus the bad people. He contrasts between them in the Quran saying, um, الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ He says, there are those people who they say to Allah, O oh Allah, give us the good of this world and they have no share in the hereafter. Because all they care about is this world. The Muslim shouldn't be those people. The Muslim should be the one who Allah mentions after that saying, um, um, وَالَّذِينَ قَالُوا uh, those who say, O oh Allah, give us the good of this world and the good of the hereafter and protect us from the punishment in the fire. This is the type of people we should be as Muslims. So Allah is telling us, no harm if you ask for the good things of this world. No harm in that. But make sure you are not exclusively asking for the good things of this world, but also accompany that. Add to that, asking for what? The hereafter, and make the hereafter your hammock. Make the hereafter what's more important to you. Prioritize the hereafter. So we should be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those things which benefit us in the hereafter. And the Prophet is showing us that in this hadith, Allahumma inni asalu huda, Allahumma inni asalu kul huda, wa tuqa, wa afafa, wa ghina. Tayyib, number two from the lessons. As we go down the list of things that can benefit us in the hereafter that we're going to ask Allah for, at the top of that list, should be al-hidayah, and then after that, al-tuqa. Al-hidayah, guidance, and piety should be the foremost spiritual matters that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, to be guided. And this is another thing too, is that we can't be arrogant and think, well, we're Muslims. We're already guided. And I've actually heard people say that. Why do we need to ask for guidance where Muslims are already guided? Because guidance is two degrees, two levels. Al-hidayah ila sirat being guided to the path, shown, hey, this is the truth, and recognizing it as such. But the second type of hidayah is the one that is more precious, and more pe many people are deprived of it, even the people who have been guided to the truth who call themselves Muslims. That's being guided, fissirat, and hidayah fissirat, being given the divine empowerment to follow the truth that you recognize, to live an Islamic life the way Allah wants you to live it to do the good deeds and avoid the prohibited deeds. And how many Muslims, they, they do shirk. They've been guided to the path, but they're what? They're not been, they haven't been guided on the path. How many Muslims commit sins? How many Muslims get into illicit relationships, drink wine, uh, miss prayers? Because they've been guided to the path, but their guidance on the path, along the path, fissirat is lacking. And perhaps it's lacking because they're not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for hidayah enough. And when they ask, they're only asking for one degree. Their intention is only one degree. When we need both degrees, 
And so it's critical, brothers and sisters, that we make it a point to ask Allah for the Hidayah and ask Him for a Taqwa. The Thumba Adalik number three from the lessons, piety is precious. And we should value piety enough to pray for it regularly. Like the Prophet said, Allahumma inni asalakul huda wa tuqa wa la fafa wa al And Abdullah ibn Mas'udi said, Kan yaqul. He used to say. Meaning what? It was his practice. It was his regular practice to make this dua. And we shouldn't be the people who show Allah bi lisanin al hal or bi al sinatuna. I'm sorry, bi lisan al hal by our by our actions. Basically, we reflect in our actions the fact that we don't value a taqwa. We show it by what? By saying certain things. Those things that we say are indicative of the fact that we devalue piety. For example, a person says, oh, "No, I don't want to make that prayer because." It might be answered, and then I'll become overly religious. I don't want to be one of these people with, you know, this big unattractive beard and, you know, wearing weird clothing. And, you know, I just want to be a person who I can be Muslim and I can, you know, do my five prayers and fast my Ramadan, but I can fit in with everybody else. You know, I don't want to be overly religious. You know, I want to be, you know, just a regular everyday you know Muslim I don't want to be overly religious overly conservative so I don't want to ask Allah for piety because he might answer my prayer and make me overly religious shows you devalue piety another 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 thing that we shouldn't say which shows that we devalue piety is a person who says if Allah wants me to be if Allah wants me to be pious if he wants me more pious then he would or should make me more pious without a dua if, if that's what Allah wants, he would, he would make it happen. So why do I have to ask for it? That's another thing that shows you devalue it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give us anything we want without us asking for it. Why does he want us to ask and then answer our prayer? Because there's a lot of benefits and there's a lot of indications from the dua itself. One of the evidence, one of the indications you believe Allah exists, you believe Allah exists. Because you can't pray on someone, you, you can't pray to someone you don't believe exists. It also shows you believe he answers prayers, that he has al-quwa wal qudra he has the ability. Because what? You wouldn't ask him if you didn't think he could do it. So there are a lot of benefits in dua. We don't have to understand the benefit. We should just pray and show. Another thing we can show is that we value the thing that we're asking for, like piety. We ask Allah for everything else, especially worldly things. We definitely should ask Allah for these uh, faith-based, spiritual uh, things which will benefit us in the hereafter. Number four from the lessons, no one from Allah's creatures can achieve any good, spiritual or material good, except by Allah's will and with His permission. We do leave that like the dua itself. The, prophet, the fact the Prophet ﷺ made this dua shows that he understands and he's teaching us through his actions that I can't be pious unless Allah ma makes it happen. I can't be God unless Allah makes it happen. I can't be afif. I can't be chaste unless Allah makes it happen. I can't be uh, I can't be ghani. I can't be self-sufficient unless Allah makes it happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, this is, uh, this is especially true when it comes to spiritual matters. A lot of people think I'm in control of my own destiny as when it comes to my faith and my commitment. No, Allah is in control of that. And one and 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 what is and what is what was what is proof for this is uh, there's obviously abundant proof, but one one ayah that indicates the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which he said, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, and had it not been for Allah's grace and mercy upon you, not a single one of you would have been purified. Rather, Allah purifies whoever he wills. Allah gives purity. Guidance, piety, chastity, he gives it to whoever he wills and he deprives it of whoever he wills. And if we want to be the people to whom this, these things are given and not deprived, we need to first recognize that we're not in control of our own destiny as it relates to these spiritual matters. And then we need to ask Allah, who is in control of our destiny, to grant us these as a gift and favor from him and out of his mercy. Last but not least from lessons number five. We learn from the hadith in a roundabout way that the Prophet Sallallahu is unable to benefit or harm himself independent of Allah's will. And that's, that's indicated by the fact that the Prophet did what? 
da. The Prophet called upon Allah for things that he needed, things that he felt were important. If the Prophet were in control of his own destiny and able to help or harm himself but through his own volition, in spite of Allah, independent of Allah, that he wouldn't have asked Allah for these things. And so if this is the case, if the Prophet is unable to harm himself or benefit himself independent of Allah's will and permission, how much more so is this true about others? And this is important. How do you feel it on min jihateen? This benefits us from two angles. One is that if the Prophet cannot benefit his own self, or harm his own self independent of Allah's will, then he can't benefit or harm you independent of Allah's will. And this is important for those Muslims who go overboard and exceed the limits in their praising of the Prophet or even in directing some acts of worship to the Prophet which should only be directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are some Muslims who actually will pray to the Prophet Some of them will pray to the Prophet and ask the Prophet for their needs. Or they'll pray to the Prophet and ask him to ask Allah for their, for their needs. One of them, the latter, is bid'ah. And the first one, the former, is actually shirk. It's a major sin. It is the, the greatest crime anyone can commit. And the thing that the Prophet came to eradicate, first and foremost. And so this is important. The second jihad, the second angle from which we benefit is that if the Prophet can't help or harm you without Allah's uh, will and permission and enabling, because he can't do that for himself, then no one else can either. And if we can't pray to the Prophet, then we certainly cannot pray for someone who is less than him, like a saintly person. And so this is important. We have to understand that who should we be calling on for these Spirit for our spiritual or material needs. Who should we be calling on? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you notice in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear, emphatically clear, that He is the one who should be called upon and He is the one who should be worshipped with a dua and other than dua. And one specific indication, which is very subtle, but it's very clear at the same time, that Allah wants to be called upon alone with no was with no uh, wasit with no uh, wasa'it, with no intermediaries, is the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah in the context of fasting in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانَ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِلَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and if my servants ask you about me, I am indeed near to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the regular sunnah of Allah in the Qur'an is when people would come to the Prophet sallam for asking, asking him a question and he waited for divine revelation for the answer. Whenever the answer came in the Qur'an, Allah would begin it by saying, they ask you and then say, قُلْ Say. And look at the Qur'an. This is مُطَّرِدْ it's, it's something which is repeated without fail in the Qur'an except in this ayah. In all the other ayat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is answering a question that the Prophet was given and he waited for divine revelation for the answer, it's always, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ إِذَا سَأَلَكَ Right? If they ask you, they ask you, and then the, Allah will say, قُلْ Say to them this, say to them this. So many examples. But in this one example, the only example that involved a dua, supplication, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, قُلْ Say, O Muhammad. He just answered them. Why? To teach us in a roundabout way that when it comes to a dua and any other act of worship, there should be no intermediary. So he didn't want to insert the Prophet as if to say, they can't ask me directly. They have to ask me through you. No, when it comes to dua, they don't need to ask me through you. When it comes to the sharia, they ask me through you because you are my deputy when it comes to a sharia. You are the intermediary between me and them and when it comes to a tashriya legislation, but not when it comes to worship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عَنِّي وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ, وإذا سألك عبادي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ And if my servants ask you, O Muhammad, about me, I am indeed near to them. No qul. No intermediary. And so this is one example out of many that we could give, but it's a very um, subtle, but very powerful example that shows 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants there to be no intermediary between us and Him when it comes to worship. And it just goes and makes a more emphatic uh, and a more emphatic statement regarding the fact that no one can help us or harm us or give us our spiritual material needs except Allah Jalla Jalaluhu wa Aduma as Sultanu. And with that, we bring today's session to a close. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as always to bless your houses, your spouses, your children, your wealth, your health, to bless you and make you blessed wherever you may be. We also ask Allah, we also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who we teach his beneficial knowledge and truly benefits from the knowledge that he teaches us by make us from those who put it into practice. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala bin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.